Okay, good morning and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. My name is Bob Bianchi. Your watches aren't wrong. It's not 12 to 3, my normal shift. It is actually 9 to 12 that I will be here with you today. I'm excited to be filling in for the great Jesse Weber because we got some amazing trials here, folks. As you know, if you've been following it, gavel to gavel coverage, as always on the Law and Crime Network. As you guys know, as a former homicide prosecutor, there is nothing worse than having to handle a case where young, innocent children who are supposed to be cared for by their parents are taken away. And all of them, all five, what a tragedy. Well, I have a special guest here today I'm very excited about because I've never been on with her before. It's Terry Austin. And I got to tell you something. Not only is she an attorney, she's got a journalism background. And not only that, she teaches at USC. So we like to call her at the Law and Crime Network, or at least I'm calling her now, our bi-coastal lawyer journalist. Terry, welcome to the show. Thank you. I appreciate it. So tell me, uh, you know, um, it, even for a seasoned homicide guy like me that's been doing this for a long time, cases like this are just so dramatic. The insanity defense is being posted here by the defense. The defense attorney did a great job in his opening statement about that insanity defense. Very skilled guy. But can a jury get over the murder of five children? I think that's going to be very difficult. Anyone who kills someone, particularly if it's their child, you think they must be insane. Mm. But the insanity defense it's not really posted that often. So it'll be interesting to see if he can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that they, obviously, he killed his children, but he'll have to also prove that he was insane, which is, you know, a lesser standard, but it's still going to be hard. To yeah, we were talking about that yesterday here with my guest about maybe the sheer murder of five children itself pushes you towards that insanity, but then you confront the law which has very strict requirements with regard to what an insanity defense is. But the prosecution in this case did a very good job in their opening statement. I kind of wish we got a little bit more about what the statements were that the defendant made, because that is going to be critical. Guys, you know when I talk about insanity defenses, that goal-oriented conduct, knowing what he did just before, during, and just after is crucial. Let's take a look at that prosecutor's opening. Okay, there you go. So, Terry, he... he gets right out in front of the defense, the insanity defense. And we've been analyzing the different state laws with regard to insanity. In this state, it's the lowest burden that the defense has to meet. In other words, that's good for the defense, preponderance of the evidence, which essentially means it's just over 50%, if you want to use that. The scales tip just ever so slightly. Some states use clear and convincing evidence, and I believe some still may use beyond a reasonable doubt in order to prove. So they got that low threshold, and then they use it whether he could not appreciate because of the mental disease or defect, the moral right or the legal right. So the prosecution has a, a, a tough road to hoe to make sure that they don't go in this direction because insanity is an outright acquittal on the case. What are your thoughts? You're absolutely right about that. And I think the preponderance of the evidence is going to make it very easy for the defense because, as you say, just one piece of evidence puts it over that 50%, and if he's found not to be sane, then he could completely get off. And in South Carolina, there is a death penalty, and if he gets acquitted because of the insanity, then he walks free. Yeah, and having been a death penalty litigator myself as a prosecutor, I think that the defense is actually doing a smart thing here. One of the axioms of death penalty work, if you're a defense lawyer, is keep your guy alive. That's the, the main thing even if it's for another hour, another minute, another second. That's how they look at it. And in the guilt phase of this case, they are already bringing in the mental health illnesses. I believe tactically they may be saying, look, if he doesn't get NGI, not guilty by reason of insanity, we have already are going into the penalty phase with the jury have heard hearing a lot of stuff that may be mitigating factors that move more towards life without parole as opposed to the death penalty. What do you think? I think that if he gets off because he was found to be insane, they could put him in an institution. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a whole host of possibilities that could occur. But I think you're right. I think the defense is trying to keep him alive because death penalty in South Carolina. There are 30 states total that have this death penalty. And I think they are trying to keep him alive, whether it's life in prison, whether it's going to a mental institution for life. The whole point is to try to keep their 
client alive. Now, and I can only tell you from New Jersey, I'm sure every state is a little bit different with this, but when you get not guilty by reason of insanity, it's not a get out of jail free card. You actually get put into a psychiatric facility, which aren't really necessarily too pleasant. And some people actually serve sentences that are longer than had they been convicted. Has that been your experience? Yeah, I think that's right. I think if you get a state that wants to put you away for life because of the insanity, you, you don't have an opportunity for parole for good behavior. So, you know, you have to look at what the consequences are. And it might just be better off to have a lesser, you know, a lesser charge and to get off with less time. Yeah, and actually, I think during one of the parts of the opening statement of the defense attorney, to your point, they talked a little bit about manslaughter, you know, there, which I think is going to be a very difficult thing. I think it, I'm pretty confident that that was what was done here. One last question. If um, all of these factors taken into consideration in the opening statements and the jury's listening to all of this, that statement the defendant gave to police to me is critical. One, but for the grace of God, this guy goes through a DUI sobriety checkpoint. They notice something squirrely about the guy, in addition to the fact he's under the influence. The car smells like death. Very descriptive term the prosecutor uses. And he eventually brings them to where the bodies were just discarded in garbage bags on the side of the road. But it's going to be critical to me to see whether these cops had the wherewithal to ask the very important questions that experts need to know, because that was days later. What was occurring at the time? Because the prosecution suggests it started with the six-year-old in a fight, and he killed the six-year-old violently and then strangled the rest. Could it be a scenario where the other kids were witnesses and he decided to wipe that family out as opposed to necessarily going through a psychotic break in your mind? If I were the prosecution, I would definitely argue that. They do have evidence that the one child was killed before the others. And it shows malice of forethought, mm -hmm. which is what is going to have to be shown here. And if they can show sequentially that one child was killed and then maybe he was trying to cover it all up, because the other children witnessed it. I think that's a very good point. Right, and there's also uh, allegations here that he may want to do it to deprive the mom who he was on the phone with at the time that this argument happened with the six-year-old, wanted to deprive her of the children. It is a fascinating case. You can only get these kind of cases on the best trial network in the world, Law and Crime. We're gonna do some business. We'll be right back with Terry.